greet each other and say hello from the week.
done and everything that you will do as we search for you and we find ourselves in your presence, Father, I pray that you would go before us in this day. Amen. Good morning, everyone. My name is Santosh. I'm uh, one of the pastors. Okay, kids, you could go to your classes. Wow, they beat me by that. The kids are dismissed. Uh, one of the pastors here at Ebenezer, good to be worshiping together uh, this morning. Uh, we're going to continue in a spirit of prayer, so let's pray together. And as we pray, listen to these words from 1 Samuel chapter 2. This is a prayer from a woman named Hannah. She prayed like this. My heart rejoices in the Lord. I delight in your deliverance. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. The Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and he exalts. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. 
He seats them with princes and has them inherit a throne of honor. For the foundations of the earth are the Lord's. On them he has set the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this morning we choose to rejoice in you, our Savior and our Redeemer, our Protector, our Provider, and our Lord. We rejoice in you. We rejoice in the salvation that we enjoy through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. Lord, in a culture that proclaims there are many ways, that there are many kinds of truths to believe, that there are different ways to live, we confess that you alone are the way, you alone are the truth, and you alone are our life. We confess that salvation is found in no one else except in you. We thank you that you give us joy in the midst of our sadness. You give us healing in the midst of our illness. You restore us when we are broken. You save us from ourselves. Lord, your word says that you set the world on its foundations. And when we trust in you, you set our lives on firm foundation. Help us to choose to trust you for our salvation and healing this morning. Lord, our hearts are broken by the images coming to us from Lahaina in the state of Hawaii. What a reminder of how temporary things of this world are, how quickly paradise can turn into a nightmare. We pray for the families of those who've died. We pray for a quick recovery of those who are still missing. Guide the fire and rescue personnel in their grim tasks. Be with the political and civic leaders as they lead during a difficult time. Be with pastors and churches that are ministering amid such grief and brokenness this morning. Send your spirit. And blanket them in your supernatural comfort this day. Lord, we thank you for our church, Ebenezer Baptist Church. We thank you for sustaining us this, these many years, and we commit ourselves once again to be under your lordship and under your direction. We pray for our many families and members who are away on vacation. Bless them on rest and renewal, we pray. Lord, we pray that your comfort would come to the Banzette family as they mourn the loss of Doug, who died quite suddenly last week, Lord. May they sense your comfort. Holy Spirit, walk with them through these difficult days as they mourn the loss and as they uh, adjust to a new normal in the life of their family. We also pray for the family of Sandra Fair as they have a, a grandnephew, Zebulon, only two months old, who's in the NICU on dialysis, Lord. Lord, we send, ask you that you would send your uh, healing presence into that room. Be with the family as they care for uh, this young one. Be with the medical personnel as they provide much needed care for this little boy. Lord, we pray for ourselves, guide us, help us as we seek to bring your kingdom in Saskatoon as it is in heaven. Help us to shine brightly in our city. Use us to bring many, many people into a saving relationship with you. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we've been able to worship already. We've been able to lift up your name and your voice. Holy Spirit, continue to guide us as we listen to your word being preached through your servant, Matt Tycrop, Lord, open our hearts and minds to the word that you have for each one of us personally, we pray in your name. Amen. All right, in the summer months, we do not take a physical offering, but that does not mean you can stop giving. You can still continue to give. You can do e-transfer. You can do monthly automated giving. You can give at the table in the back there, and you can even write a check. Does Gen, Gen Z know what a check is? Do you guys know what checks are? Have you ever seen them before? We'll, we'll show you how to write a check in the back. So. But I encourage you to incorporate tithing and giving as just a regular part of your Christian life. Giving and tithing should be as natural to you as worshiping, as reading your Bible, and as praying. Um, if you are new to our community, we'd love to connect with you. And one of those ways you can do that is to use the QR code uh, behind me and to send an email to the church staff. And we'd love to connect with you and get you connected in uh, different ways to our church. Uh, and as I prayed uh, in, uh, for the Banzant family, the funeral is coming up, and we need uh, people who can help in that, and you can contact the church to figure out how to do that. Uh, last week, we made a really, really exciting announcement that 
eight babies were born, not at the same time, but they were born like in the last month in the life of our church family. And that's always exciting when we make announcements like that. But babies grow up and they become little kids. And we love little kids and we love kids ministry here at Ebenezer. And we want to care for the emerging generation well. And one way we can do that is in help in getting you to help as volunteers. And as we gear up for the fall, our numbers will greatly expand and we have need for more volunteers. And again, you can contact the church to find out uh, in ways to connect with that way. But that's a really, really important ministry in the life of our church. Now I want to invite up our speaker for this morning, Matt Tycrop. Matt is not a stranger to many of us. He serves as the district minister for our denomination, the Baptist General Conference. And he's been a source of a lot of encouragement to me as a new pastor here at Ebenezer and in the district. So thanks, Matt. Thank you, Pastor Santosh. And it's been great to get to know Pastor Santosh and get to be a part of the beginning of his ministry here with you as one of the co-leads. And it's um, good to know the heart of your servant in that way. And so you have a great, a great man in your co-leadership along with Pastor Chet and the other staff here. So that's awesome. As uh, mentioned, I'm the district minister for the Baptist General Conference in Saskatchewan, and it's been a joy to be able to go visit our churches and this summer have spoke at a camp during a staff training and spoke at a couple of other churches, and I have uh, another church down Regina next week, and, and then uh, coming in fall, there's already a slate starting up. So it's good to be a part of your, our church family and be there to encourage and, and walk with you in ministry, and I always want to share with you the heart that I feel that you have as a congregation for our conference. Thank you so much for your support, for your encouragement. It's a great blessing, not only to me, but to the greater family of churches within the BGCS and BGC National. So God's blessing. Uh, before we go any further, I'd just like to open in prayer with you before we go into our, our message for today. Lord, we are so thankful for you and how you walk with us. Lord, you have promised that you would always be with us, that you would never leave us nor forsake us. That brings to our attention, Lord, that it's not that you just want to be around, but you are in us by your Spirit, that we appreciate and cherish, but often, I think, take for granted your presence among us. And so I pray that as we're reminded of this in this passage today that we're going to be looking at, that you would speak to our hearts about how we need to be more, um, more in tune with your presence in our life and what that means and what it would mean if your presence is missing. So I pray that you would guide our time together in Jesus' name. Amen. So as a church, we are in the seventh week of this series, Upside Down, the Kingdom Parables. The parables where Jesus said the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is like. And to give us a direction and keep us focused, I really appreciated the definition that Pastor Cal established in the very first uh, sermon that he opened up this series with. And, and I'm going to have on the, on the screen behind me here a slide. It's what he said, not so much what he had on the screen. And and I remember I, I listened to that, that sermon because I wasn't here that Sunday, but I heard what he said and what was on the screen. It's, it's the same, but he just had these thoughts. The kingdom of heaven, or God, is the place, the realm, or the domain where Jesus reigns and rules. Now, this is not reference just to one place, but wherever Jesus is by his Spirit, in Luke 17, the Pharisees and Jesus are having a conversation about the kingdom of God. And look at these verses as to what that conversation was like. Being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, The kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. Nor will they say, Look, there it is, or there. For behold, the kingdom of God is is in the midst of you. Jesus is saying, because I am here, 
The kingdom of God is here. You, you cannot separate the kingdom of God from the presence of God. In other words, the kingdom of God is never void of God, and God is never void of his kingdom. His presence is among us. Which brings me to the parables that I chose when asked to preach today. They're found in Matthew chapter 13, verses 31 to 33. And I encourage you to follow along in your Bibles if you have them. Or if you have the scriptures on your phone and you're able to take notes, I encourage you to do that. Because often what I've noticed when going through these parables, we, I, you know, I, I listen to uh, it being explained to me, I hear the message of what it's about, and often uh, later on, if I haven't taken notes, I think, what was that again? What, what did this exactly mean, or how, how would I explain this? And this it would help you if you have your Bible and, and you're able to make notes, even in the Scriptures, just to help you cue in to some thoughts as to what they mean. So here we go, starting at verse 31, Matthew chapter 13. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. Now that last parable about leaven, it is what draws our focus and our attention to what the kingdom of heaven, heaven is like, and that is the presence of God. I'll talk more about this parable in a moment, but without the presence of leaven or yeast is what we're familiar with when we're talking about leaven. What, what you get, if you don't have a leavening agent like yeast, what you have is unleavened bread. Without the presence of yeast, all you get is flat bread. Now, sometimes that's exactly what we're looking for. We really like unleavened bread in its authentic state. Now, there are times where we order things like focaccia bread. Did I say that right? Uh, have you ever been to a restaurant where you say, I I'll have your focaccia, and the waiter or waitress, you mean focaccia. <laughs> so I thought, I'm going to find out, how do you actually say this? So I Googled it. That's where you find all truth. <laughs> and so I, I Googled it, and, and I found it that the history or where it comes from is it's Italian. And so I pushed the button to hear, how do you say this? And this is how it would sound. Focaccia. <laughs> okay? So you got to make sure if you're going to say it. So I dare you to try that sometime in the restaurant. I want focaccia. Okay? It's, just try that. So, but that's in its authentic state. It is unleavened bread. There's also naan bread. There's also pita bread. There's bannock. You know, in their authentic state, they're unleavened, and we, we like that. But if you are ordering bread, and you're, ex you're ordering what you think is that light, fluffy loaf, and you're thinking, I can hardly wait to have a piece of that kind of bread, and when it comes, it isn't like that, it's actually flat bread, you would say, there's something missing. Which brings us to the quick understanding of this parable of the kingdom of heaven is like leaven. The presence of God is so important in our lives that when his presence is missing, you know it. You live life feeling like there's something missing. Have you ever been there? Would you say, that that's where my life is today? And you can't explain it. You feel like everything's going right. I mean, you're making the right choices as far as you're concerned. You're working hard. You have a great career. Everything just seems right, but you're, in your mind you're thinking, something is missing. The question is, what is missing? It could very well be that it's the presence of God. Well, what is the presence of God like? Well, let's start at the beginning of this passage for today and find out. So verses 31 and 32, they read like this again. The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. 
It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree. Now, before I get into this, I feel I need to settle some questioning thoughts. For some of you, you aren't even thinking about this, but there may be some who are botanists. That is, you are plant biologists, or let's put it more simple, you are a plant and seed guru. You, you just have in mind that, okay, wait a minute. This is, the mustard seed is not the smallest of seeds. For example, the seed of a lady slipper orchid is 20 times smaller than a mustard seed. And then this is where some who critically analyze the words of Jesus, they say, you know, Jesus cannot be the creator. I mean, if he is the creator, he would know that it's not the smallest of seeds. And so, therefore, he cannot be the Son of God. For if he was, he would know that the mustard seed is not the smallest. Therefore, I cannot believe or trust what he has to say. And true, if Jesus only said the mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds, they would have a case in point. But that's not what Jesus said. That's not all that he said. He said the mustard seed is the smallest of seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree. In other words, the smallest seed that has the capability of growing into a tree is a type of mustard seed that when it germinates and grows to maturity, it looks like this. This is the Nicotiana Gluca. In other words, it's a tobacco tree. But it's a form of a mustard seed that it grows. It has yellow flowers that when they blossom, they're brilliant. But when they get to maturity, they form many, many seeds. Does Jesus know what he's talking about? Now, knowing this, we see that it is fitting for Jesus to use the mustard seed and leaven as a parable to explain what the kingdom of heaven, which I'm going to now refer to from here on in as the presence of God, what this is really like. And to start, I want you to consider some thoughts about what the kingdom of God or the presence of God is like by looking at three of the principal figures in these two parables. These would be the mustard seed, leaven, and birds. And when we have examined this together, we're going to see how does this relate to our lives. So first, the mustard seed. It helps us understand the presence of God may seem small, but it's not insignificant. For you who are followers of Jesus Christ, true Christians, are you aware of the scope of the family that you belong to, the family that is under the headship of Christ? Are you familiar with how grand this family really is? We tend to think the Christian movement is so small, and in the grand scheme of all that is going on in our world and our culture, it's insignificant. We often refer to ourselves as the minority in the world, and we are. We know that our voice of the truth of the gospel, the truth of the scriptures, we know that it gets op opposed, that there's opposition. We know that there are voices that are trying to keep the gospel or the scriptures from advancing. But as followers of Christ, we are one way that the presence of God is in the world. Here's how we consider this. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 to 17, we're told, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. Now, the temple from the Old Testament scriptures, as well as into the New, in the Jewish culture and faith, the temple always represents God's presence. The Apostle Paul says, as individual followers of Christ, we are that temple. 
And then in Ephesians, when talking about the church, Paul says in Ephesians 2, verse 22, in him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So we as individual believers who are allowing Jesus by his Spirit to reign and rule in our lives, we make up the church. And we are the presence of God on earth. God did this for our benefit, but for his kingdom's sake. Now listen carefully. How did he do this? Jesus said in Matthew 13, verses 31 and 32, and as I read this, after hearing what I've told, told you already about the things about leaven and so on, how we are the temple, the presence of God on earth, just think about this as you hear this, these verses again. And I have this feeling that as you start to hear this again, you're going to realize that, oh my, the lights by the Holy Spirit are starting to turn on. The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds. But when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree. The presence of God under the new covenant started with one small seed, which Paul refers to in Galatians chapter 3, verse 16, as Christ. He was small, a baby in a manger in Bethlehem, small. Very few noticed. Oh, there were the multitude of angels that they noticed, and they glorified from the heavens. But on earth, very few noticed. There were the few shepherds, the wise men, and there were the two in the temple. One was Simeon, and the other was a prophetess by the name of Anna. They, they knew through the power of the Holy Spirit and constant prayer who this seed was. They marveled, they worshiped, they gave thanks to God. But at this point, no one else knew that the kingdom of heaven came in bodily form in the presence of Christ. But as Zechariah chapter 4, verse 10 says, the people should not think that small beginnings are unimportant. Concerning Jesus, the baby in the manger, Luke 2, verse 40, we're told, and the child Jesus grew. All right, the seed is growing and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. At the age of 12, the teachers in the temple, they were amazed at his understanding and his answers to their questions regarding the Scriptures. When Jesus was 30, Jesus, the man, was 30, but still God. When he, when he was 30, he took the seed of this gospel that he had come to be the leading head the chief cornerstone. He took this seed of the gospel and began to sow it in his field. And it germinated and began to grow. He called 12 men to be his disciples. So what was once one, now was 12 more. And in three years, the 12 became 120 who gathered in the upper room, obediently waiting as Jesus had told them. Then the day of Pentecost came, and the presence of God by way of the Holy Spirit came upon the 120 men and women. They shared the gospel in languages. In other words, they preached. They did not know. In, they preached in languages they did not know. So all could hear of this good news of the salvation found through Christ. Peter gave a message, and people repented of their sin, accepted Jesus as their Savior. Then they were baptized. That one day, the 120 grew by 3,000 more. And from that day on, the Christian faith of Christ our Savior has grown to where the presence of God, the kingdom of heaven, is in most nations of the world. Do not think that small beginnings are unimportant. And the presence of God is insignificant. Through this parable, Jesus is saying, although my movement appears to be small, it is very significant. And my presence isn't always acknowledged, but it's germinating to something substantial. It is like leaven. It is permeating throughout the world, one person at a time. 
Now, although we hear of other religions that are growing in our world, the majority of their growth is based on fear. Their form of evangelism is, you accept our religion or you die. What are you going to do? I'll, I'll believe. But there's no heart. There's no commitment. I just don't want to die. You know what the fastest growing religious sector is in our world today? It is the evangelical Christian faith, which is based on hope and peace found only in Christ. And the testimony is that many from the fear-based religions are seeing visions of Jesus. They're hearing him call them into a relationship with him. And as a result, they are coming to faith in Christ. The closest estimation at this point is that the single seed has grown to be a tree of 600 million strong, and it is not done growing. The kingdom of heaven or presence of God may seem small, but it is not insignificant. The second principal figure is the leaven. It helps us understand that the presence of God is subtle. As we've already touched on, Jesus also said in verse 33, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. In Scripture, leaven isn't always seen as positive. At different times, Jesus told his disciples, beware of the leaven of the scribes, or beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, or beware of the leaven of the Sadducees, which has to do with false teaching. In Scripture, yeast is also used as a symbol of sin that permeates a life, which is why the people of Israel were told to eat unleavened bread at the Passover. And we could go on with other examples of how leaven or yeast is used in a negative sense, but in this instance, Jesus is referring to the kingdom of heaven or the presence of God and that it is to be viewed as positive. Leaven or yeast is incredible in how it works. When it is added to flour and the other ingredients, we don't hear anything. We don't see anything. When added to the flour along with the other ingredients to make that dough, it is working and you don't even notice. I remember watching my mom intently when she would make buns or bread. She didn't use the quick rising yeast. She, she used the kind that you would mix beforehand and add it later. I don't know if you're familiar with that. But then when she would put it into the mix of the flour and the other ingredients, she would knead this dough into a small little ball, and she put it in this big bowl. And I was thinking, that's a big bowl. And she'd cover it with a tea towel, and then an hour later or so, she'd come back, and I would hear her say, Whoa! It had gone over the sides of the bowl. And she'd bring it back in and she'd punch it down and do it all over again. It's incredible in how it works. And I believe what Jesus is saying is, are you aware that God, like yeast in flour, is doing what he does in your life right now without you even realizing it? You're not even asking. And God is doing God is working. We sing a song sometimes called Waymaker. And the lyrics you may be familiar with, it says this, even though I don't see it, you're working. Even though I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. That's how the presence of God works. It's like leaven. You may not always see it. You may not always feel it. But he is permeating and he is working. In Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 5, the Lord says, For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. That is how he works. It doesn't matter what you are dealing with in your life personally, whether it's physically or whether it's spiritually. The kingdom of God, God's presence, is upon you like leaven, subtly doing his work in your life, even if you aren't into God. Even if you say, I don't have any use for him.
Even if you would say, the only reason I'm here is because I really like that guy or that gal. I'm just letting you know. God is doing what he does subtly like leaven. He is working in you. The kingdom of God is upon you. That, that, that does not mean that you're saved for eternity unless, of course, you have believed by faith in Christ alone. But it does mean that God is subtly working in your life that you may be saved. And if you are saved, you have come to him by faith in, alone. He is still working in you so that you would grow. And if you have been saved and you are growing, he is still working in you that you would be effective for his kingdom. He never stops working, even though you don't see it or feel it. Third are the birds. They help us understand that the presence of God draws attention. When talking about birds, this is a little tricky because in the parable of the sower, if you remember, who did the birds represent? Do I hear anybody? Satan. It refers to Satan, that he would come and he would take the seed. When talking about the mustard seed that came, became a tree, Jesus said in verse 32, it is the smallest of seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. This is not just one kind of bird. It includes all birds. The, the songbirds. Well, we like the songbirds. But even the irritating-sounding magpie and the predatory sparrowhawk, they come too. At first, the magpie and sparrow, they seem harmless until they attack or do their squawking. I, I, I heard people who are visiting Saskatchewan for the first time how they see the magpie and they say, oh, what a beautiful bird. <laughs> and then they have the audacity to say, is that your provincial bird? <laughs> and I say, I sure hope not. And it's not. But, but they don't know. But when they hear its voice and they find out this is what this bird does, they change their mind. But here's how we interpret this. The presence of God draws the attention of all people. Those who long to be in the presence of God. Jesus said it's like birds who build their nests. They just want to hang out in God's presence. They want to glorify him. They want to worship him. They want to serve him. They want to grow in their relationship with him. They want to be in his presence. The presence of God also draws the attentions of those that are seeking him or searching for him. Maybe someone here today is that way. God's presence has drawn you here because you're searching. The presence of God also draws the attentions of those who are unwanted in our society. Those who feel that they're unwanted. Just read the Gospels. Just see, when you read the Gospels, who was it that was drawn to the presence of Christ? You will read, there were many, many different people groups, many different individuals. There were those who were lepers and the outcasts. There were the prostitutes, the, the adulterers. There was the religious. All kinds of different people were drawn to the presence of Christ. At the same time, the presence of God also draws the attention of those who want to irritate and destroy the work of the presence of God and what it is accomplishing. Do not be mistaken. Satan notices when the presence of God is active and successful in drawing people to the presence of God. That's why you need to pray daily for the filling of the Holy Spirit to guard you and to walk with you. That's why you need to pray daily and regularly for your church and your pastors. Unfortunately, it's not just the demons that, that Satan uses. He uses people sometimes that are within. So he will send the sparrow hawk in. And at first you're thinking, oh, what a graceful bird as it flies. But you don't realize what this person will do, and one day it reveals itself. It attacks. You need to pray because all birds are drawn to the presence of of God. So now how does all of this relate to our lives? 2,000 years ago, 
Jesus told these parables because people were struggling to see how God was moving, how he was moving in their midst of the chaos and the religion of their then known world. And as a result, they, they missed the presence of God through the person of Jesus Christ. And I don't think it's a stretch to say that's the same thing that's happening today. With the chaos of our world and the challenges of religion, people are missing the person of Christ. 2,000 years ago, what Jesus was inviting the audience into was the same invitation he invites you and I 2,000 years later to, that we adopt the mustard seed leaven mentality. That just because something is small or unnoticeable doesn't mean it can't become something big, something significant. And just because it seems insignificant doesn't mean it isn't germinating or it isn't permeating throughout the person or people or our, the people around us or the ministry that we're involved in, whatever it may be, that is permeating that it might someday become very significant. In a world of chaos, it's very easy to believe the lie that God is dead. Very easy to believe the lie that he's just maintaining and he's doing his best to keeping it from flying apart and it looks as though he's not winning. We had a pandemic that caused a lot of relational grief and brokenness. We're also reading the, the, and seeing the travesties of war and fire. We're also seeing and hearing the backbiting of politicians. And we find ourselves thinking, God, are you even here? Do you know what's going on? Are you even present? And if so, why don't you stop it? From our understanding of these parables today, we need to have the mindset that even though we don't see it, we know God is up to something. And what these parables challenge us to do is keep doing the small things. Because the kingdom of heaven, the presence of God is upon us. For we have no idea how big God wants these things to become. Let me give you an example. An example that had a profound impact on the church. In Acts chapter 8, a man by the name of Philip obeyed the Lord's message to go to Gaza and talk to a man from Ethiopia who had was a servant of royalty. Philip went thinking, fine, I mean, I can do that. He went, and he found this Ethiopian man reading a messianic prophecy from Isaiah. Philip explained to this man what he was reading. He said, what you're reading is a prophecy about the man and God, Jesus Christ, and that he came and took our place for our sin. And as a result, this Ethiopian man received Christ and asked to be baptized. All of this started by a small act of obedience. I'm sure Philip would have thought, just one small thing. I mean, I'm just going to go tell a person, talk to him. I don't know why I'm talking to him. When I get there, I find out he just wants to know who Jesus is. So I did it, one small thing. But it turned out pretty big because the man gave his life to Christ and was baptized. But it got bigger than that. Remember Zechariah 4, verse 10. I encourage you to remember this. The people should not think that small beginnings are unimportant because the history of Christianity supports that through the act of this one man, Philip, and his obedience, that is how the gospel got to Africa. Keep on doing the small things. And if you are doing what you believe God has called you to do and you're not, you're not seeing the impact and you, that you're longing for or, or you're thinking, this isn't even work, and you're continually trying and trying, you're thinking, why do I even bother? Continue to remain faithful in doing the small thing and over, do it over and over again because you have no idea what God is doing. You don't see it. You may not feel it. I read a quote that comes from Jim Collins in his book, How the Mighty Fall, that goes like this. The signature of mediocrity is chronic inconsistency. Daily consistent faithfulness to the small things is what produces the positive things. 
Parents, continue to have those devotional times and prayers with your children. Continue to pray for your adult children. The trend today is parents are afraid of sharing their faith with their children because they feel that they're interfering with their children's decisions. Continue the small things. Let them know that you're praying for them. Invite them to join you to church. You have no idea what the Lord is doing. Employees, employers, be faithful in consistent godly work ethic and relationships. You have no idea what the Lord is going to be doing. Pastors, be cons consistent and faithful in prayer and proclamation of the Scripture. You have no idea what the Lord is doing. Jesus invites all of us to adopt the mustard seed leaven mentality to bring the kingdom of heaven, his presence, to whatever context we are in. The parable of the mustard seed and leaven are of great encouragement to us. But I also believe they offer a word of warning. The principle of something small can become something big and permeate in ways that we could never imagine also can bring negative results. So think of it this way. It was just one small omission on that report for the government or my boss. What's the big deal? It's just one drink every day. What's the big deal? It's just one Instagram account that I'm following. It's just one harmless text. I just wanted to see, how are you doing? It's just one touch to, the, to that attractive woman or handsome man. What's the big deal? that I'm married or they are married. See, the danger is that when we begin engaging in things that are small, but we have some sense in our heart that this may not be right, but we do engage anyway, and we don't experience some negative effect soon thereafter, we believe that it isn't a big deal. And what becomes cautionary at first becomes common down the road. And something small becomes something big, and it will permeate our life and the lives of others around us. Every significant failure, every bad habit addiction always begins with some small compromise that builds up over time. If you find yourself today engaged in a mustard seed leaven situation that is heading for danger, then the hard truth of these two parables is to believe the lie that something small isn't really germinating, it's not really permeating into something big, it's not going to bring any devastation, it's no big deal. That's a lie. And what I'm about to tell you, I tell you in deep respect and love for you. You're missing something. You're missing the presence of God. So bring whatever that is before God and deal with it. In order for the kingdom of heaven, God's presence to be in your life, your marriage, your family, your workplace, your ministry, it only takes one small mustard seed action for the positive. And what is that? Confess and repent. I'm going to invite the worship team to come. Jesus invites all of us to adopt the mustard seed leaven mentality, to experience the positive of God's presence in our life, but also deal with the negative that is keeping God's presence from our life. And as we go into this closing song, take time to pray and ask the Lord questions like, where am I failing to embrace the mustard seed leaven mentality? Where have I failed to see that you may be doing something significant in something small that I have been doing, but I just haven't been faithful? 
And at the same time, ask the hard question, Lord, where have I been making small compromises that are hindering your presence in my life and if left unchecked, could develop into something dangerous? Now, if you have sensed that the Lord by his Spirit has been speaking to you and you would like prayer, come forward. There are pastors at the front that will be praying with you. So let's go to prayer and begin this unleavened and mustard seed mentality. Lord Jesus, I praise you for this moment where you have allowed by your spirit your word to come into our hearts. Lord, I pray that it wasn't just empty man's words that they heard. Lord, I prayed earnestly for this moment to be all about you. Lord, I pray that in every heart that there would be this openness to be encouraged or to be challenged so that good things can come. I pray this in your name.